Hey guys and gals, welcome back to another episode of Bass Quest. Just want to say I'm really thankful to everybody for all the support I've been getting lately. The channel's been growing like crazy. I'm over, over 3,500 subscribers now. I'm trying to get 5,000 before the classic, so make sure y'all keep liking, sharing, and subscribing. Seems like you guys really like the educational type videos, some of these guide videos and the live streams. I'm going to keep doing both of those since y'all are liking them. Um, today's video, we're going to get into high and dirty water. This is something that is going to really play for you guys right now. I mean, the conditions, it's absolutely pouring down rain outside. I had record rainfall in 2018 that's pushed on into 2019 it's just absolutely poor and what that means is water fluctuations water levels are up and down depending on what the dams are doing a lot of current um, fluctuation as well and of course water clarity is going to go up and down as well with all this rainfall and so what that means is we need to learn how to adapt to these changing conditions we need to get up there fish new water find out where these fish are roaming to so today I'm going to break into everything I know about fishing high or dirty water it's going to be a complete guide video I'm I'm going to jump into first some fish catches so if you want to watch the first part of the video it's going to be fish catches then i'm going to jump into more of the teaching and then finally we're going to jump into a map study so y'all stay tuned this is going to be awesome well what y'all missed is i've caught three fish now off camera i can't get my cameras to work but fishing after a big storm really muddy water and uh what we're doing right now is hitting a current break it's got some fish stacked on it, so stay tuned and see if we can snag another one. There he is. A small one, of course. Get the camera working, catch a small one, right? <laughs> There he is. A little bit better. A little bit better. Got the front hook. That's a good sign. Oh, missed him. There he is. Got him that time. Better one. These fish are using this little point as an eddy. So they're just kind of hanging out there, waiting on bait fish to come by. There he is. No. Oh. As you can see, it's pretty fast and furious. That's a pretty good one. I'll leave them gummies get them fish good. Ooh, golly. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Moved out a little bit. I mean, I got hammered by one before this one got it. That's a good one, though. Another good one. Ooh, come on up here.
There he is. Beauty. He didn't want to do that. Yes, better one. Oh, yeah. That is exactly how you want them to eat it. Golly, come on now. <laughs> Fish is strong. I mean, chunked it. Thanks for staying with me so far. If you like the video, go ahead and smash that thumbs up button for me. It really helps me out. And you can subscribe to the channel as well. It's absolutely free to you. If you go into one of these corners, you'll see my icon. It's got my logo on it. It says subscribe. If you hit that, go ahead and press the red button. It says subscribe. It'll turn gray. And then all you got to do is click. There's a small bell over there. If you click that, it'll give you notifications when I post a new video. I'm going to be doing this every week. So hope it helps you out. Let's jump back into the rest of this. Hope you enjoyed the fish catches. Now we're gonna jump into the teaching. Now the first thing you have to understand is that high water and dirty water are not necessarily synonymous. You can have water that's rising without the clarity changing very much. So I think the first thing we need to define is what causes high water and what is high water. Now in most parts of the US, high water is caused by rainfall. So you have rain that falls around the lake, it runs into the lake, you that, and it causes the water level to rise. However, there's a lot of other factors that we need to think about. For instance, on the Tennessee River, you have dams that regulate the water flow. So you can actually have no rainwater in your area. 
However, a, a reservoir above you might be getting a lot of rain and they begin to push more water through, which causes more current and a rise in water in your reservoir. Oftentimes, this doesn't change the water clarity because it's coming directly down the channel and so you don't even have inflow from your creeks or anything like that. Another factor that I've seen is dam work. So if they're working on one dam, they still might be pushing water from another one, which can cause the water level to rise. Additionally, rescue efforts, if there's say a sunken boat, um, recently we had a plane that went down, a lot of times they'll stop the dam in order to get down there into deeper water and pull wreckage out or however they need to do things. And what that causes is a rise in water level as well. So, so it's really important if you live on any river system that you pay attention to the dams and the reports that they give you as far as the current and the water level. And that can tell you if the water is rising. Now the second thing we need to talk about when it comes to rising water is how much of a rise actually makes a difference. In some cases, you might have a huge flood come in, you have several feet of a rise, whereas in other cases, you know, maybe a little bit more output from a dam just causes a few inches of change. Well, in my opinion, just a few inches, especially on shallow water fish, can make a huge difference. It can push them way further than they were before. Um, I've noticed deeper fish, they'll slide up, but they don't tend to slide up quite as much unless there's more of a rise in water. Now, the third factor about rising water that to me is very important is duration. For example, is this like a short-lived event or is it something that's prolonged? When you have prolonged floods, there's more and more fish, and that's usually with dirty water, more and more fish will push towards the bank, they'll push right up to the bank and stay there. Whereas with short-lived variations in water, you'll have a much smaller window. Fish will come up and as water recedes, they'll start to push back down. It seems like a smaller population of fish will actually push up. So you need to know in your mind where you're going beforehand. Now we're gonna jump into dirty water. And first of all, we're gonna talk about what causes dirty water. And as we all know, rainfall when you get tons of rain you can get flooding and that can cause you to get a lot of dirty water into the lake but that's not the only thing that can cause it i've noticed also like we talked about before so you get a lot of rainfall in the reservoir or lake above you they start to push a lot of current through it can actually pull a bunch of sediment can pull grass and different things out of the flats on your lake and actually make your lake dirty um, it can also happen if you have a lake that typically, or a river system that typically gets dirty above you, they can push a bunch of just dirty water from that body of water into your lake and it can run down the main channel. Another thing that I've seen is a lot of birds such as cranes or diving birds will get into a backwater or even trash fish like big carp and buffalo will get back there rolling around and they can make an area really muddy without there being any other external cause and you can get the same kind of effect. Second thing we need to talk about is location, location, location. It's very important to know where on the lake the dirty water is, um, what stage of dirty water you're in. So say there's certain creeks that might clean out faster, so you need to know how to move in conjunction with that. Same thing with the main lake. Find areas that are really dirty, stained, clear, what the fish seem to be wanting, and what you like to fish as an angler. So understanding all of that, understanding your body of water can be super important. Other than that, if you're on a new body of water, you're gonna have to really run around and explore that for yourself. And that's where looking at Google Earth to begin with, like we've done in the past, seeing those kind of areas in advance, what gets dirty first, what gets clean first, can be very, very important. So the third thing we're gonna talk about is actually what is dirty water? How much stain in a water makes it dirty? And that's relative as well. You know, we're talking about different parts of the lake that get dirtier. Well, if you're on the south end of one lake, having just a little bit of stain, you know, going from eight foot visibility to four foot visibility could be dirty water there. However, if you're up in a river system where visibility is typically maybe three foot and it goes down to six inches, that could be dirty water there. So this is all relative. You have to understand that in the context of your own body of water. For me on Chickamauga, most of the time I feel like I've got visibility in that three to four foot range. Um, certain parts of the lake you have more and so this is going to change a little bit. But when I start seeing water visibility drop down to a foot or less, to me that's when I'm in dirty water. Um, to me anywhere between that foot to two foot is stained water. That's just the way it is for me over here. And dirty water versus stained water can affect fish differently. Now the last factor of dirty water is again duration. Just like with the high water, the longer that water stays dirty, the more fish it's going to push up to shallow water and they're going to push right up against the cover and be easier for you to catch. All right, next we're gonna jump into the map study and I'm gonna go over different baits that I use to catch these fish in these areas and the different areas themselves, depending on the water clarity where I'm gonna find these fish. All right, first thing I wanted to show you was the TVA website. You can actually go down, find your lake along the Tennessee River system. There's Chickamauga right here. I'm gonna link this link up here down in the description, but it'll give you good information. Um, first thing it'll show you is kind of like your generators right here. The more generators you're running, the most likely the more current's gonna be running through here. 
and you can see hourly discharge we have tons of tons of gallons of water coming out here when you tell they're running over 94,000 in the 90s. You have a lot of current running down the lake. So that tells me immediately they're trying to get rid of some of this higher water. If I look down here into predicted data, if I looked over here, if I look over here and observe data, I can see that we're actually losing a little bit of water. It came down and now it's coming back up. If I go to the last 48 hours here, uh, lake elevation, you want to look at the reservoir elevation, not the tailwater, because then you're looking at Nickajack. But right here, 78 or 678.29 if i go down here we're actually below that point in 48 hours so we have actually right now we have falling water i'm assuming that's going to start changing pretty quickly though with the amount of rain that we're having now let's talk about where i find these fish if the water starts to get high or muddy now we already talked about this is high wassy running in right here um, anytime we get any kind of flooding or a lot of rainwater, the dirty water is going to come from Hiawassee and it's going to run down the river here. And anything on the east side of the lake tends to stay muddy for longer because of that. Um, the Hiawassee just kind of blows everything out. Now, a lot of creeks on the west side of the lake, you know, I know from experience, Sail Creek and Saudi Creek, they tend to clean up a little bit faster for whatever reason, whereas Possum Creek takes longer to clean up. Um, Chester Frost seems to clean out relatively quickly, but any of these lakes on the east side, or sorry, not lakes, but creeks on the east side, such as Wolf Teaver or Grasshopper, they take much longer to go ahead and clean out again because they are on the east side of the lake. Another thing I noticed is that when you have a lot of current coming down the lake, it starts to bring, especially from Hiawassee again, it brings some of that over to um, the lines of the flats here. So let's say here's a flat. A lot of times you'll have muddy water along the front edge of this flat, but as you push up into these kind of flats, um, in a lot of cases, the water will get a little bit cleaner or at least stained. And one thing I notice also is when you get a lot of water inflow like this, the water starts to get muddy. Um, it starts most of the time in the backs of the creeks and it starts to work its way out and it goes all the way out to the main river. So what you'll notice sometimes is that say the water is worked its way out and it's muddy on this side of the bridge but on the other side of the bridge it's already begun to clean up and way in the back of the creeks it's already super clear so the timing of all this you almost have to kind of run back into some of these creeks sometimes in order to tell um, where you're at and what stage you're at again same thing with soddy creek you got a lot of creek water coming out it may be dirty here but not dirty in the back and then it may be stained towards the front so what I'm typically looking for, say the whole lake is blown out. We're gonna start, which is really muddy, really high water. It's been a flood. Um, what I'll look for is where the fish have been. So maybe they, they're working their way into the creeks, maybe their main lake if it's summertime, but typically adjacent to wherever those fish are and whatever stage they're in, if you run in here, those fish will slide up and they'll slide into ultra shallow water. And this is again, we're talking ultra uh, dirty water, six inches of visibility, um, ultra high water. They're gonna slide right up into that and they're gonna look for any kind of cover such as lay downs, stumps, docks, any kind of cover right there that they can butt right up against. And you can go and fish these areas in likely spots. You know, if you see a lay down, go over there, start flipping around it. Sometimes it takes multiple casts. Um, a lot of times you'll have to use maybe a crankbait through there or a spinnerbait. Um, another thing that I see them get on as far as just structure wise is like a rock pile that's right close to the edge or maybe like a rock wall. They'll sit right up against that sometimes. So those are areas to check out. Now in contrast to that, if the water is stained, so say there's more than a foot of visibility, in a lot of cases what you'll notice is these fish, they'll pull up shallow, but they're not necessarily cover oriented. In other words, they're comfortable being out onto the structure of the lake. Here's an example of an area that would be good during that time. You have a point that runs way out into the creek channel here in Saudi Creek. What happens a lot of times is say these fish are working their way into the creek or out of the creek, however, whatever stage they're in, what they'll do is they'll push right up on to this point itself or a little saddle or a drain and they'll push right up on top of it and they'll sit there and what they'll do is they'll get in the eddy just like you saw in that video you know you had water that was flowing out and it was coming into a little drain this would be an example of a small drain and kind of like in a saddle there and when that water flows out there those fish can set up and they can ambush bait as it's coming through so they they're again you have to understand that if that water has any kind of good visibility to it a lot of times they can be offshore sometimes they'll be on bigger more expansive flats like this get on some shell beds um, get up around a little rock piles and stuff like that and a lot of times they'll group up and school up together 
when that's the case. All right, as we talked about before, especially all right, as we talked about before, especially if you're in a new waterway, it's very important to go ahead and get on Google Earth, download the Earth, and you can go up here, this little clock right there, and it can give you historical data. I always recommend going back in time a little bit, and you can find events where the water was muddy, such as this one right here. And you can see in this particular creek, we got mud flowing out. However, in the backs of some of these little uh, drains in and little creeks in, we already see the water is beginning to clean up. And so areas like that are very important to understand and look at your individual waterway as a whole. Here's Sail Creek. We can see cleaner water in the back. Some of it's dirty in the back. And then as we push out, it gets muddier in this particular situation. Another thing, it's affecting water down below that point. So just wanted to remind you guys again, get on Google Earth, look at historical data for your waterway. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about is individual baits that I like to use in what situation. Now, when you're talking about really ultra stained water, when fish are pushed up against visible cover, they're pushed right up, nosed up against it, you want something that's gonna hang out on their face for a pretty good amount of time. And for me, a jig, a black and blue jig with a rattle in it is something I can start flipping around. I can make multiple flips uh, quickly and efficiently into that cover. Another thing is like, that MGC Custom Tackle Mag Shaky Head, I like to take that thing. Um, I'll put a big uh, creature bait on there, a big worm on there, something with a lot of presence where I'm intruding on that fish over and over, making multiple flips, and that can get a bite. Another thing I like in the shallow water, a square bill around some of that cover or a spinner bait. You can make multiple casts. I use a nighttime spinner bait a lot of times, which is a big Colorado bladed spinner bait. I can make multiple casts into that area and hopefully get that fish to, to come unglued on that. Now, when we're talking about stained water, um, water that's, you know, plus a foot of visibility, some, somewhere in that range where those fish can be a little bit more offshore on some of that cover or structure there. What I'll typically use, you saw me in that video, I was throwing a lipless, still something loud, still something intrusive, but it's something that I can cover a little bit more water with. You can see I was really aggressive working those fish. And that's the way Cole and I, if you guys look, watch that lipless video, Cole and I had a lot of fish catches there. We caught like 40 fish. Same thing, we were you know, fishing a mud line in a little current break in dirty water. And what happens is those fish pulled right up on some structure there because they were still, they were comfortable grouping up together out there on that. We were able to take advantage of that. So lipless can be really good. Again, a rattling jig, I like to hop that thing through there, bump those fish, really get them you know, frustrated where they'll take a tag or tag that thing. Again, the big worm is another good one. Once you find those fish to go ahead and throw that thing through there, spinner bait again. Um, the only thing that I would add to that really is a rig. A rig can be excellent as well when you're talking about fish that are kind of a little bit more offshore. You can throw that smaller rig shallow, get those fish to commit to it and mess up on it. Now, if we're talking about an area that's more rocky, that's got more of a transition where those fish are sliding up from deeper water, just kind of up along the rocks there, for that, I really like a jig for one, and for two, some kind of a uh, small body crankbait. You see Alex Rudd throwing those a lot of times. He's really gotten me into it, and I've seen the benefits of it the last few years. But that wiggle wart, um, something bright, vibrant color, wiggle wart, um, Bandit 300, Spro Rock Crawler, any of those baits can be money in that dirtier water if those fish are just a little bit deeper. Thanks for tuning in to the video. I really hope all the, the fish catches combined with the teaching and the map study, I really hope that helps you catch some fish in these conditions that are coming up along the Tennessee River and really the whole Southeast in general. Make sure if you like the video, smash the like button again, subscribe to the channel. And if you can share it out to your friends, that'd be great. Trying to get to that 5,000 subscriber mark by the classic. And if there's anything that you want to see or any clarification that you need, make sure to comment down below. Um, post those. I try to answer as many questions as I can to help you guys out. But as always, guys, I hope this week finds you out on the water, and I'll catch you there.